Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. The Jason Cabinets Experience is sponsored by Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or few people through our automated HR platform and by giving you your own dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Joe Todd. Joe, are you ready to be great today? Yes. <laughs> Joe Todd is currently the Deputy Chief Technology Officer of King County, where he is co-leading the transition of KCIT to product teams and SAFE. He has over 20 years of experience as a technology practitioner and leader, including a background in aerospace, software development, system integration, enterprise collaboration, local government, and technology innovation. Before his time at King County, he served as a chief information officer at the city of Tequila and the senior manager of application development and collaboration at Alaska Airlines. Joe, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So Joe, um, let's dive into your background real fast. Um, I told in the pre-talk, like, it's almost like you had no other choice but to be successful, right? Because what your, your, your parents or your grandparents on both sides did, were, like, they added a lot of value and they gave a lot of service. How did it have, like, those role models doing great things for the world impact you? So, uh, for me, from an early age, um, my father, my mother, my grandparents, um, being really involved in the community um, was just part of, of life. Right. Um, that it was truly to who much is given, much is required. And when it came to, you know, being involved and making sure that you're giving back is just part of the DNA of, of my family. Um, like I've got generations of cousins that have spent time in the military. Um, um, my father uh, spent time in, was in the Marines and then he was also a psychologist. My mom. Um, medical field um, and being involved and, and, and really trying to make sure that from a perspective of being black Americans, being African Americans, that they're giving back to the community, even, even my grandparents, uh, right? Uh, my grandmother starting a school, an elementary school. How old were you when they were doing that? Was that before you were born or they did it without you? you were, so they did that before I was born. But then the, the cool thing is like, I grew up and I'm five years old and my grandmother's my kindergarten teacher, mm -hmm. right? And so it's those types of things that are very foundational in your life um, that when you start out with that kind of mentorship, with that kind of background, that it's, it's all about paying it forward. I mean, you're five years old and, and people are saying your grandparents built this school. I, mean, I can't imagine the, the impact of pride and positivity that had in you, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, um, just being able to see the lives that my grandmother touched, um, the people that she was able to affect, um, for me was a life changing thing, right? To, to be able to see, um, someone to see a problem in the community. And then during a time where, when my, my grandmother grew up and, and in the deep South, yeah, trying no, to accomplish yeah. something like that is pretty ridiculous, but she did it. I mean, and, the and she South, did it for the community. You know, it had to be like forties or fifties. I'm guessing you know all this. You know, just man, just the drive and you know, passion you had to do for you. Like, I mean, talk about obstacles against her. I can't imagine the obstacles she had against her. You know, right? I mean, part of the right community. We don't we don't need a school here. All that kind of stuff. You know, and she had the drive to keep on going. Right. Um, and is that school still in operation? No, no. So my my grandmother died. Um, and then um, after my grandmother died, um my grandfather passed away mm -hmm. but not too um, long after that as well and so um that school um it closed was it like a private school or public it, school? it was private and i know when i and when i read about you it was like an important the poor community of alabama so it's like more like more rural um so no so i, I lived in mobile alabama okay which well, is a rural. pretty large yeah. city um it's the second largest city okay. in the state of alabama so okay um and your motto is success is in, service is my DNA. Mm -hmm. Is that something you just came up with recently or that's been your motto for a while? It's been a model for a long time. Um, service is d definitely in my DNA in that um, from a public service perspective, I feel like um, I should be giving back, mm -hmm. period. Whether it's through public service or through volunteering or community activism, right? Um, I am all about making sure that marginalized and vulnerable communities have a voice. Um, a lot of times um, you hear the squeaky wheel when it comes to government, when it comes to local politics. And those folks that don't have the margin to be heard, 
that don't have the margin to go out and have conversations because they're too busy trying to keep a roof over their head and food on the table. Um, there's got to be those folks out there that stand up um, for marginalized communities. And, and, and that's what I'm here for. I'm here for all of it. How you deal with this, right? You know, you give them back, but there's a point where you can give back too much, I think, right? Mm-hmm. How do you make sure you have that fine line where you give back, but then you also take care of yourself? Well, for me, fundamentally, um, giving back is taking care of myself. Um, e- even though I've been successful as a black man, um, I am still very much part of that mar- marginalized and vulnerable communities that don't get, a, that the voices don't get heard. And so for me, giving back also affects my life as well. I mean, from a, a big thing about uh, me and my wife, who has been an amazing partner in this activism in uh, making sure marginalized vulnerable communities have a voice is our son is a black male, right? And we want to set a path for him to be successful in the future. And that means doing the work now, laying the foundation now, making sure that we're making changes within the system now so that people that like him and other BIPOC kids that are coming up right now will be successful in the future and won't have to deal with some of the things that we've had to deal with. So this next question could probably come out wrong, but suppose you're, like, you're, you're, you're giving back mentor like certain people, right? How you know it's really worth your time? Like how you know like this person is getting impacted needs, right? And like, like how many people, what's your point of where it's okay, this person getting that and I can keep on mentoring and helping them out. This other person, like they're not paying attention. They're, not, they're going down the wrong path. I need to focus on the person who's getting stuff out of my mentor. Or is that, or your thing is like, I'm going to mentor everyone, take care of everyone as best I can. Uh, my motto is uh, mentor everyone and take care of everyone as best you can. Okay. Um, I, it, it, you truly can't leave anybody behind. Um, because someone might make a mistake or um, appears not to be taking the advice or uh, going down the path of direction that you think they should be going, that means just work a little harder. Um, too many times uh, we get into difficult situations and we give up. And, and, and in, in this moment, uh, we can't give up. Um, there, there's too much that has to happen for us to be successful in the future. What's your definition of, of mar- marginalized community? Uh, marginalized communities for me are um, historically distri- discriminated against communities like black communities, indigenous communities, um, Asian communities, um, LGBTQ. Um, our seniors who we completely don't have a conversation in, in our in, in communities right now how when we have seniors, there's age discrimination like crazy, right? You work a, you do an amazing job um, with a career that you've had and you've raised a family and they've gone on to be successful. And now you have a home, you're, you're established and you, you're trying to go into the sunset of your life, right? And normally what happens is they get priced out of communities. You, yeah. you, you can't even live in the place where you decided to raise your family um, because you get priced out or you get gentrified out. And so when I say marginalized, I'm, I'm talking about that scope of um, BIPOC, LGBTQ, and then also our, our senior communities, which um, get left behind. So kind of off subject, but like it's, 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 you know, ageism is a thing, right? It's like 50 and above, it's hard to find a job. But if you go to the United States Congress, any government, most of them are above 50, right? So, <laughs> like, so it's like a disconnect, right? Right, right, right. Um, I, I, I've never understood why um and i and i've seen it um in my career even even when i was coming up um as a young leader um i would hear other leaders um say well yeah that guy should retire or it's time for that person to go as if they've reached this age limit where they can't add any more value instead of learning and and being and and listening to the the things they bring to the table and how amazing um, their experiences are that help you get through difficult decision-making processes that you have to go through, right? Because they, these folks have been there; they've done it. Yeah. And 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 then you come along, you think, oh, this is this new idea that's gonna change the face of how we do business. They're like, mm. <laughs> kind of seen it before in a different flavor. Yeah. So, man, and here's some of the pitfalls I saw. And so, I, I think it's very valuable um, to have folks late in their careers. 40s and 50s to start having conversations with um, folks about the value that they add, right? Instead of trying to say, well, no, you're at the sunset of your career, right? So let's talk about diverse real fast. So like I got, I retired from the Army 2014, 2015. 
I kind of got involved with tech startups, kind of like you nobody know, the accident. And uh, there's always talk about diversity, right? Mm-hmm. There's like focus groups, all this thing going on, podcasts on it, you know, the diverse officers, corporations, but I'd be wrong, but it's like the numbers are getting better, right? In some ways, um, the numbers are getting better. In other ways, the numbers are getting worse. Um, right now, um, I think we've made some good inroads in starting to make sure that women are being taken as a valuable commodity when it comes to um, the technology sector um, and, 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 and building the pipeline for women as well, right? Um, where now in schools, we're saying like, hey, STEM's an area that you should be getting into. Whereas before, it, women weren't directed. No. Girls weren't directed in, you know, it, it to be in software and biology, um, in the medical field, right? It was all about, no, no those are areas for men. You, know, you, you guys go be school teachers and things like that, right? And, and now they're like, you know, there's not enough men in school teaching, right? Well, there's so many females. So, you know, right, diversity, right. you think diversity works both ways, right? Right, right. Um, and especially there, there aren't enough males in, the, in, in teaching, to be honest. Um, but it, it, it's funny though, right? Um, we create this environment to where um, women were directed into that field and things like nursing, things like that, right? And then we want to come back around and say like, oh, well, there's not enough men. Well, we set that environment up. Yes. Right? And so I think it's for us to have these conversations to say, we need to start thinking about across the board how we do equity and diversity, um, both men and women, and when it comes to um, race. Remember back in the day, if you were a man nurse, you got made fun of, right? right. Like, you're a nurse? What's wrong with you? Right. And then I know, I know there's, a, there's a stat out there. I'll probably get it wrong, but I think 80% of uh, females in elementary school want to be in tech, STEM, right? It drops like maybe 80 to 10% in high school, right? So it's like what happens in those five or six years make it go from 80 to 10%, right? How do we fix that? I, I think a lot of it is peer pressure. Yeah. And yeah. peer groups, right? I agree. Um, where um, you start to have conversations with folks who are in your peer group that don't see as much value in STEM as you might see it. And, and, it's, and, it's, and I, I like it's an easy job, right? I mean, it's, uh-huh. it's, it's kind of hard, right, to be a software developer. It's, it, not, like bas- it's not like basket weaving. It's not. It's not. Um, but um, I think one of the key things is, um, whereas it used to be where you had to go to college and learn the theory around computer science and then move into software development, I think we have moved into an area now where we can actually start looking at software development um, in high schools, right? Um, because right now, um, even even at the state as as a state law, um, there's a house bill that got passed that um, all high schools have to have a valuable um, technology. Uh, it's a shame it's 2021 20, and it's not passing law right there. So. I know it, it's a it's a it's a big shame. But I, I am glad around, I'm glad that um, people are seeing the significance of the United States um, being a place where the service industry is a huge deal, right? Yeah. And if we're going to do software, and software development has become a key skill set that you're going to have to have at all levels, right? Even, even low code, yeah. even when you think about uh, things on your daily, daily job, it's going to have a bit of software development in it. Yes. And we need to start at the high school level. We need to start at the middle school level. We need to start at the elementary school level and teaching kids these concepts so it's not foreign to them when they get into the workforce. Let's talk about this real fast. So if you're a junior high school student, we'll say it's Seattle, Washington. I have to say, you have, as far as to get have an advantage of a kid growing up, you know, like, I don't know, Dripping Springs, Arkansas, with a population of a thousand, right? Mm-hmm. Is there a way to fix that dynamic where like everyone has the same access? Um, I think, um, you know, putting a political hat on, um, I think one of the things that we have to do is prioritize these things from a political perspective mm-hmm. um, and making sure that we're giving funding um, from a technology perspective to schools um, to make sure that it's a focus. And then also making sure that um, we are starting to get industry involved um, in the design of curriculum so that as kids are matriculating through um, our education system that 
you know, they're, they're being very well prepared for the jobs of the future. Because right now, um, you know, you know, reading, writing, reading, writing, and arithmetic, right, are, are things that we focus on. But we leave out the fact that we're going to this entire digital world where you might not even learn, have to know how to write in cursive or write in a book, right? Or, I mean, I'm sorry, write on a piece of paper. Um, and so we, we have to start this transition. Now I, now, I do understand, yes, definitely, we don't want to lose the art of being able to write on a piece yeah. of paper, right? Um, but it's also very uh, significant that we want to keep um, our, our kids very relevant and what the future is going to look like. And that's going to be very different than um, what you and I have seen yeah. uh, writing on a piece of paper. Yeah. So back to diversity, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people have the wrong, uh, and of course people agree or disagree with this. A lot of people have the wrong uh, definition of diversity, right? For example, a while ago, there was a picture in a magazine for black men. I think they, they, they were like graduate law school, Howard, some report, what a great uh, picture of diversity. So is it really diverse for black men? Now, I can understand they say these four black men, like one of them came from Atlanta, one was Clackett, one immigrant, but are they, is they really diverse? Another thing too is like, I think too many people, they're like pro their demographic. There's nothing wrong with that. Like if you're pro, pro black, pro Hispanic, pro whatever, pro BQ, are you really diver- for diversity, right? So can you talk about that real fast? Yeah. Um, so there's diverse has to be everything, right? Everything coming to the table, collaboration, but. So I, th- I think um, what we're really talking about is not only diversity, but equity mm-hmm. um, and making sure that um, no matter what you look like, you have equal access um, to resources and opportunities. And, and from my perspective, um, I'm pro people um, when it comes to making sure that everybody has equal access to resources and opportunity. Um, because I'm pro people, um, I tend to focus more on BIPOC communities. Um, because we know if we focus on generations of people who have been marginalized and haven't had opportunities and resources that everybody gets yeah. opportunity and resource. And so when I do focus on BIPOC communities, it's, it's, it's purposeful um, because I know that the value that is placed on making sure that BIPOC communities have an opportunity, it affects everyone. Because all the studies, all the stats show that the more diverse your company organization is, the better you're, you're off, right? The better ROI, ROI you have, right? I mean, think. I mean, it's 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 foundational in building products and services, right? Um, you have multiple customers out there that are different colors, yeah. different backgrounds, different cultures, and if you're not significantly designing your workforce to match what it looks like out in the exactly. community then you're not going to be able to produce products and services that are equitable yeah. and that are fair and impartial um, when it comes to delivering these products and services to the community. I mean, like if you're trying to sell to the Asian community, there's no Asians in your workforce. Exactly. Like, like are, are you kidding me right now? You know? Right. Like I'm a firm believer that like, you should hire the best person for the job. However, comma, you also need to reach out to communities, right? You know, mm-hmm. and, and, and cause there's talent everywhere. Right. I, I know one challenge, well not challenge, are like, so like a lot of these tech companies, they'll say like, we don't hire diverse people. But they've had like, you know, we'll say like, you know, like majority of white people, white guys, right? And they keep on going back to the places they find the white guys, right? They're not going to the communities where those people are at. And I just think it's the thing they're making a mistake on. They got to be more, like more driven, so to speak, you know? And I think a lot of people like have like, like, um, remember back when the George Floyd got murdered, you know, a, a lot of these companies were like, you know, they just came out, all this kind of stuff came out. But if you did a deep dive, like there's no, no people of color working for them. It's like this is this politically expedient statement, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, I am completely over um, performative messaging mm-hmm. that um, makes people or appears to people that you are trying to make some significant changes within your organization um, um, to help equity and social justice, right? Yes. Um, you, know, you know, we talked about the fact that I ran for office. I ran for Renton City Council. And one of the big things is as I was doorbelling, um, canvassing, campaigning out there, um, I saw a lot of Black Lives Matter signs in people's yards. Um, But at the same time, they wouldn't want to open the door and have a conversation with a Black man that's walking up to the front door. And so I am tired of performative messaging um, where um, 
we're, we give these outward appearances that we're trying to make changes and we're not doing the significant work, right? Um, you know, I don't, I don't want to go to another training that talks about equity and diversity. I want to see some action around this training. Um, just making people aware that there's racism. People, we, um, people know that, right? I'm they know that's, that's not new news. It's not new news, right? And, and, and to me, while we do need the training, there's got to be that next significant step to where you actually make changes so people are successful. Because if we, if we just stuck on this, this training piece, we're not getting to where we need to be. Yeah, I definitely agree with on that. And, and I can't remember what company it was, but a few years ago, it was a two big tech company, Kept California. The two diverse offices basically like switched jobs, right? And, and, and they somebody did like a deep dive on, the, on those, all the stats. The, the two companies actually got worse during their time of office, right? So the, the reward for going down was, you know, the equally same job, right? So like, what are we doing, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a challenge. Um, so next thing, talk about your mentorship that you do with the students. Is it, is it mainly focused in the written area? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm mainly focused on the Puget Sound region, the South King County. Okay. And uh, making sure um, we're mentoring young people um, to get into STEM. Do you do anything with, with TAF? I don't do it. Okay, okay. No, so no, it's no. something separate from them? Okay. So it's separate from that, yeah. And this stuff you do on your own time, like volunteering? Yeah, stuff I do on my own time, volunteering. Um, uh, uh, at one time, I was working with the Urban team. Um, but one of, the, one of the big things for me is how do we make sure that we are letting kids know that there are these amazing STEM careers out there that they can take advantage of that they don't know anything about. And you mainly focus on junior high school, so middle school students or high school? Middle, high school. Okay. Um, and, and because that's, that's one of the significant areas where um, if we make sure that we're getting kids involved in STEM, helping them understand that these types of jobs are available, um, that these things can be life-changing with the amount of pay you can make, those types of things, that they don't even know about. Um, and then uh, one significant thing for me is really getting kids involved and starting to understand how important it is to get into skilled labor roles too. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, definitely. Um, there are some amazing construction jobs. And out there. so many openings right now. It's Pipe fitting, it, you, you name it. There are jobs out there that students can get into pre-apprenticeships now. Yeah. And at, at 16 years old, and they actually start working toward um, having a, long career in skilled labor. I remember a couple of years ago, I volunteered at TAF, do some stuff with them. And we had a thing with the eighth grade students, what I did, did some pitches to us, right? And this one, one group, there was three of them, their business plan was like, use a natural electricity from your body to charge your phone up, right? We're like, can this happen? Like, what is our ask question, right? But then two days later, two of the people dropped out because they couldn't come back to school anymore because stuff, people were going to home, right? So like, man, this, they have this great idea and now they can't do it because, you know, home stuff, right? It's mm -hmm. just a shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think as a society, um, we have to change people's experiences and how they engage in community, right? Um, if we don't create environments for people, for people to be successful by, by having the right kinds of wraparound services in place to make sure that people don't fall through the cracks, then you'll have that kind of effect where um, students want to be a part of something amazing, but then they can't be um, because there's issues around um, poverty and abuse, that kind of thing that keep them out of being able to take advantage of really amazing things. So talk some about um, somewhere I read where you're growing up as a kid, you had to deal with racism and a lot of bad stuff. Can you talk about how that experience affects and impacts you mentoring these kids now? Yeah. Um, so I went to a private um, school um, when I was coming up um, about the age of around fifth grade. Yeah. When I was about the fifth grade is when I uh, first got into the school. And for me, it was a, a huge challenge in that being the only one, my, my sister and I um, initially were the only um, two black kids going to the school. And traditionally, what, what these schools were, um, the school was named Faith Academy. And 
historically, um, what people don't know is after segregation, um, in order for white kids not to go to school with black kids, um, these academies got created. A lot of times they are attached to Christian organizations. Um, and they were really set up so you wouldn't have to go to school with black kids since desegregation, right, was put in place. And so for me, my sister and I were put into this environment where not only um, were we like the only two, but even the schools that we played sports against um, were in these kind of backwoods towns where um, they were purposely designed to make sure that black kids couldn't go to those schools. And so, I mean, um, not only in the school I went to, but in the schools we'd visit as an, as, as me, me as an athlete, I, I just be called names that you wouldn't believe. Um, nooses being hang, hung in locker rooms, um, jokes made at my expense, um, you know, teachers not taking me seriously. And for me, um, knowing that there are a lot of BIPOC kids that have that experience in school um, pushes me more and more to provide a way for kids to really understand that, you know, I see you. Because I wasn't seen when I was growing up, right? Um, I was looked at as an outsider that shouldn't have been there in the first place. But for me, having that experience, I take this stuff head on. Um, and I understand that there's kids out there that aren't being heard, they're not being seen. Even, even if you're going to a, a, an all-Black school, right? There's still that possibility that you're not being seen. And I can see from, that, from the experience that I had when I grew up how that can play in how you're successful in getting your work done, how successful it is maybe transitioning into um, going to college or getting an amazing job. And so those experience, experiences for me highly affect how I work with students today. So what you went through is bad and you shouldn't have gone through it. But having said that, did that uh, experience make you, make you mentally strong to make you a better person? How, how did the mentally strong talk play in that? Yeah, for me, it does make me mentally strong um, because I've seen it. I've seen it all. You know, um, a lot of times um, people get surprised by the way people act. Um, for me, I learned at an early age, people can do really hateful things. And so um, it, it has made me mentally strong where um, in some cases, I, I, and I guess it's kind of a bad thing, I kind of expect the bad, the worse, um, before I, I, I think there's going to be an experience of levity and, um, something to be celebrated. Right. I always, always have this, this, this healthy pessimism that it's not going to go the way that I think it's going to go. And so talking about segregation. So I went to a school in Odessa, Texas, so Hector, Hector wow. Independent school district. We were the last school district in the United States to segregate, right? Wow. So it was like the 81, 82, right? And mm -hmm. I actually was like only, I lived on the, you know, quote unquote, the black Hispanic side of town, right? Mm -hmm. I remember like, they said that all the black schools, like the high school become like junior high, you know, that kind of stuff. And we all got shipped like three, three, three miles or four miles to the high schools, right? And the white kids didn't have to go anywhere, right? I also remember like, when, so there's two high schools, the premier high school, like the football powerhouse and, and OHS. They did a district where all the, you know, elite athletes from the South side went to premier, right? And so I just thought that they tried to shut all the black stuff. And matter of fact, the high school had just built, they had just won the, the state championship in 4A in basketball and built a brand new field house, right? Got turned to junior high. So I was like, man, this is kind of messed up, right? Like what's going on here? But the fact they were the last district in the United States that, that segregate, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of funny when I, when I try to explain um, to people who haven't lived in the South. Um, and understand the experiences that I had when I was there. And even from the perspective of some of this stuff was happening in 1996, mm -hmm. 1995, yeah. 1994, right? And so um, I've always, it, it's kind of funny when you get into these conversations about uh, racism and um, inequality that's still happening very much. And, uh, but people want to look at you and say, well, no, 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 that, that, that happened a long time ago. It's not really that far. It's our lifetime, right? I mean, right. 
it, it didn't happen a long time ago. And, and in fact, um, what, what you'll see with racism is it, it, it evolves. Um, when you put something in place to impact racism um, from one perspective, it evolves into a more sinister method that is less conspicuous. That's a good follow up question. Is it better to know someone's racist or not know? Like if, if like if someone's racist, you don't know they can do their things, got either going on and keep people down. But if you know they're racist, like isn't that better that you know they're racist? Absolutely. That's what I've had a hard time here in the Northwest. You never know, um, because people are very. Um, they've learned very much to, to toe a line in front of folks, but, um, behind closed doors, you never know what they're saying about you. Um, and, and, and that's the sinisterness of, of racism, right? When it evolves, um, and changes and morphs itself to where people will say, well, it's not there. You know, it's not affecting you. Um, move on. Right. Uh, we're, we're in a post-racial uh, country. I mean, Barack Obama was president. What are you talking about? Right. And, and, it, and it's so not true because uh, uh, what, what happens is we typically as individuals don't want to face the hard conversations and talk about the hard things around where this stuff is built into the system. And, and I'm not saying that um, we should hold trainings and make white people feel guilty um, about being white. It's not about that. Um, what I think the training should really focus on is allyship, right? You and I working together to tear down these structures so that we're all successful because that's, that's what ultimately that's what folks in power want us to do. They want us to feel like we're on opposite sides of the, of the um, conversation, opposite sides of the coin, opposite sides of the community. We never should talk and get together to make sure that we are, because if we do, we'll find that we are on the same page about a lot of this stuff, right? But the culture wars are designed to keep us apart so that we can't get together and make some real significant changes around these things. What's your advice on this? So let's suppose there's a company out there that we'll say, I'll change it up. Say they have 10 white females, right? And maybe we got to hire some guys, right? But what, what guy's going to go work for coming to 10 white females, right? Like, how, how, do, they, how, how do you advise them to reach out to these different people? And I bring them on. Like, if you're if you're a guy, when do I want to work this all female company? Right, they're probably like you know, doing female things, you know. And vice versa with this all male company, they might be doing like you no know, bro bro stuff, right? You know, having beer pong party stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has to do with culture, right? How do you how do you recommend it to, like change your culture? You know, do something where you can bring like people not on the on the program. I think you have to be intentional about how you go about uh, applying um, equity and diversity in any workplace. And it starts with the culture that you are, um, because no, no matter what organization you're in, um, you may not have tried to um, lay out a specific culture. But you have a culture. But you have a culture. And you have to significantly pay attention to that culture to be successful in diversifying it, if that's your goal. Um, and, and your goal is not to be performative. Um, and so... I think one of the best examples um, for me is when I was at the, the city of Tukwila as a chief information officer there, we had an amazing uh, police chief that was very intentional. So he saw across the community that there weren't enough police officers that look like the community. So he was very intentional about um, instead of listening to the um, peanut gallery said, well, there's, there's not really enough African-Americans or Hispanics out there that want to um, be a police officer. He was very intentional about going across the country. Yeah. You gotta, yeah. You gotta expand your recruiting base, right? Exactly. And looking for it, right. It, you have to go way beyond, um, you know, throwing a job wreck up on monster. Yeah. And hope, and hopefully it kills me. <laughs> we'll come to say, well, we put the job on our website. Yeah. No, let's go to your website. Right, right. Ho hopefully uh, some brown person to find that job wreck, right? But you have to be very intentional about it. Um, there are places where you can, if you want to find some black police officers to laterally move into an organization where they don't have to um, be a cadet and actually go up through the process of learning how to be a police officer, 
you can find lateral uh, police to move into and move into your organization, especially if you make it real around providing bonuses and those types yeah. of things to get people to come. How many pay movement expenses, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so incentivizing these things, right? Because if you really want to make a change, you'll, you'll put the work in to make it. But if you're just being performative, um, you, that's all you're going to do is throw up a job wreck and not, and not really try um, to make a significant difference. Yeah. Like, like I'm talking about the veteran community. Like there's a lot of companies out there who'll say, I'll go by 2026, hire 10,000 veterans. None of them come back in 2026 and say, hey, we only hired 2,000 out of 10,000, you know, because that's bad for publicity, right? It's always good. We're going to hire 10,000 people. I think Starbucks did it. Only, Starbucks only company said, hey, I'll go with like 10,000, we're going to hire 3,000. These steps are going to take. So many companies say, like, say performative, but they don't serve the stats in the day, right? Mm. You know, having worked with a lot of folks in the military um, when I was at the Boeing company, I was always surprised at how um, organizations would look at the training that the military spent hundreds of thousand dollars per soldier giving this training, helping them understand the job role, creating this amazing employee, right? Because they've, they've got the determination, the discipline, all those things that the military, um, you know, pours into um, soldiers. And then they come back and they can't find a job. And I'm like, how is that even possible where you're saying this person isn't ready for the workforce? They're ready for the workforce more than anybody on the planet, right? Uh, because of the process, because of the environment that they've come up through. And if we're talking about, well, this military training is not applicable to what the job role is, forget that. <laughs> um, we already know this person is pretty successful if they've made it through the basic training and, and have been a, a soldier for that, that four-year term, right? So we already know they can, get, they can accomplish the work. Now just train them. Exactly. Stop, stop worrying about um, folks walking in the door. I can't tell you how many entry-level jobs I've seen where it's like, well, this is an entry-level job. What experience do you have? <laughs> that kills me. <laughs> it's an entry-level job. What do you mean what experience do they have? It's entry. <laughs> it's designed to bring people in that don't have the experience to give them the experience so that they can move through the organization and become a, an amazing resource for the, for the organization. And what the two things I think I'm going to get a bad rap for, I don't, a lot of people don't realize how diverse army is, right? Because yeah. I've worked with people in Puerto Rico, Korea, all the, a lot of people have this image of U S army, like basically all white, but it's not like that. It's, it's a lot of like diversity and it's very collaborative too. Right. It's like mm -hmm. one of my interviews I had for post army at, at a big corporation here. Right. So it's a phone interview. I said, hey, Jay, I know you're supposed to interview for this one job, but can you interview for this other job, one below it? I said, well, can I ask why the change? Well, the job you, you're interviewing for, at first, you have like seven dark reports. This other one doesn't. I said, well, I was, you know, I retired as a major, blah, blah, all these people. Well, we understand that, Jason, and appreciate it, but at our, at our company, we let people be collaborative. I know in the Army, you just tell people what to do. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, this probably ain't a good fit. You know, I'm not even not waste your time, right? And just the, the, the stereotypes like that are still out there. Like, the, the Army, the Beetle Billies, and, um, the other places like that are gone, right? It's all collaborative. Like in the, in the army, if you're like a do as I say person, you, you, all the, all those people forever, you gotta be collaborative. There's so much talent, right? Yeah. Perfect example. Um, the police chief I was talking about, um, was literally a, a, a one-star general in the army, um, and a helicopter pilot. And if you don't think that guy <laughs> has the capabilities as a leader to run an organization, then there's something wrong with you. Yeah, maybe the army's failed, right? Right. If and so, one star generals can do a basic job, like, come on now. Right. And so another friend of mine, he's a major in the army, and he's an amazing leader. And he uses that skill set um, that he brings from being an officer into the workforce and knows very well how to lead people and how to be very collaborative. Um, it, the, while, yes, the military can be very theory X in his leadership style and very hierarchical and saying like, well, well you do it because I told you to. Yeah. Um, I have yet to meet most of the military folks, that, military leaders I know are very collaborative about yeah. how they approach. You have to be because you fail if you don't, you know? Right. Because you think you can just get, get the job done by telling people to do something, even in the military, you're not going to be successful. No, I mean, one time, my second time in Afghanistan, I, so... um. I, I ran, I was in charge of HR. We had like NASCAR people coming every two weeks, had to do that. I was in charge of the Joint Visitor Bureau. Basically, we had like a one star coming every day to visit the, the, the detention center. Also, with the Red Cross, 
or any any training program. Plus, I had to do the HR stuff for Fort Lewis and some units in Colorado, Kansas. So all that, some people were like, you know, wow, well, can you really multitask? Like, are you kidding me, right? Like, <laughs> are, are you joking? Are you kidding me right now, right? right. Like, I, I don't get it, right? It's, mm. it's it's a challenge without a doubt. Let's talk, talk about something a little bit um, less uh, serious. Yeah. Talk about your running and hiking. How do you got involved with that? And what, how, what do you do with that? So, you know, I've been a runner ever since I was in high school. I uh, ran in college. So you do like marathons, like mid-distance? Uh, so marathons, mid-distance. Okay. Uh, I was a sprinter. Um, I did the I did the four hundred meter hurdles as well as um, the four by one, and I did the four hundred meter as well. Um, and so I've always been a runner. Um, but then, you know, as we moved out to the northwest, um, we really discovered the hiking and like all the beautiful yeah. um, trails that here that you can like, man, you just put some shoes on and go out. <laughs> you can have an amazing time. And so for me, it's a release. It's a time when I can get away and and just be lost in my thoughts, right? Um, it, it's it's a way for me to break away, um, and and that's why I do it because um, you, you can get out, connect with nature, and you do this to your wife also, right? Yeah, so my wife, my you're waiting for you to bond and kind of like date runs or date hikes, so to speak. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, and and, and then we got we we got some great friends that love to go hiking as well and explore and and see new things. So so that's a big deal for me. We haven't been able to do a lot of hiking um, and getting out um, since the pandemic, but um, a lot a lot of things for us is like we love to run. Um, I mean, so much so that we, you know, set up a. A, 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 um, a, fit, kind of a fitness room in our home where you know we run lift weights that kind of thing at home and 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 for me like i said it's just a release it's a, it's a way to get away i'm guessing you do these runs and hikes you don't, you don't take your phone with you like you're tech free oh yeah i don't i don't take a phone or anything you just just get away talk about the points like you know, you know everyone says you know listen to podcasts every minute consume something we talk about the points like you know actually like let, letting your brain go idle and like thoughts come to your brain talk about the points of that um, so I can talk about that in two ways. So um, over the last year, um, social media has just been a part of my life when you, you're campaigning for office, right? And so for me, it's been a great release just to be able to like turn it off and, and not think about making a post or talking about any kind of political issue. Um, and that's the same way I feel about when you get out and exercise. Um, just, just get away, um, from the digital devices and be left with the thoughts and, 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 and think about some of the things that, um, possibly could change your perspective on things. Cause that's a, a lot of times that's what I think about. Like if I've had some particular hard conversation in that day and I run, um, and my thoughts are kind of think about, like, I just re, kind of replay it in my mind. Cause I'm, cause I, I do like uh, six to eight miles a day. Wow. And so I'm replaying it in my mind. Right. And I got time cause I know how long I'm going to run. And so I'm replaying that and going like, okay, so how should I have managed that? How could I, how could that have been different? What could Joe have done better in that scenario that you couldn't get if you're got music going on in your ear and or listening to uh, an audible <laughs> while, while you're doing this run. So, so are, are you an early morning run or are you run after work? It all depends on how yeah. I feel that day. I'm sure weather has an impact on you too, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'll run in the morning. I'll run in the, in the, uh, I, what I really love to do is run at noon um, or in the evening. But, um, but, but I do like some of the morning runs because especially like, like this morning, uh, I had a morning run because I knew I was coming here first. Yeah. Um, you have a favorite, a favorite hike? Um, not in particular, no. Okay. Yeah. And these hikes, what's the, like, is all in the local community? Or you do ones like maybe Eastern Washington or all, all like pretty much in this area? Uh, what, what we love to do is, is do the hikes around Mount Rainier. Okay. Love, yeah. love going there. I one time I did a hike there and just by accident, I went to the glacier, right? I had no idea it was a glacier down. Oh crap. The glacier, right? Let me, you know, suck it up and this is the glacier, right? You know, mm-hmm. it, was, it was kind of funny. Like, so when I really got into hiking here was, um, I was actually working at the Boeing company. And was new to the Northwest and had a guy invite me out, go hiking, which hiking for me back in Alabama was flat land. Bunch of mosquitoes. Bunch of mosquitoes. Right, right. But 
you know, a friend of mine invites me on a hike and I'm just thinking, oh, okay, he's just going to be a hike to some low level tree lines mm-hmm. or something like that. Right. And you see the mountain like that, like, oh my God. <laughs> well, it's funny. So, you know, he, 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 he says, Hey, yeah, we're going to hike Mount St. Helen. But I'm thinking, uh, that's not going to be like a, a, any kind of serious business. Mm-hmm. Right. So we get there and he gives me some crampons and some gators and mm-hmm. trekking poles and an ice axe and a rope. I'm like, wait a second. What, what a we, rope. What, what, what are we doing here? So, I mean, literally I, I, I got, I got, uh, and you know how, uh, Pimco talks about the Northwest man. Mm-hmm. I, I got introduced <laughs> to the Northwest man in a hike that we went through tree lines and went up Mount St. Helen and, it was amazing. And so the, it really, I, I remember um, when we got midway up the mountain and I looked out at this one stopping point and I looked out and, and you could see in the Oregon and see the, the, the three sisters. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, yeah. this is amazing. Right. And so that's what got me hooked. So what would you do in this situation? So let me rephrase this. Let me go back to something else. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you've worked in private and public sector. Yeah. What's the difference between working in them? Is it basically you just do the same thing, private or public, or is it something different you got to do each one? What are the different challenges? I think one of the big differences between public and private sector is the products that you're trying to deliver. And one, you're delivering products that drive revenue for an organization. The other, you're trying to deliver services that change people's lives, that allow people to grow and thrive, right? And there's no better purpose for me um, since I've been in public service where I get up in the morning knowing full well that the technology work that I'm doing is designed, is designing systems and applications and leading teams that are trying to change people's lives. And that's the, that's the biggest difference between um, the private sector and public sector is the products you're trying to deliver are the products of life, right? You're trying to deliver applications and systems that make it easy for someone to get healthcare. You're trying to deliver applications and systems that makes it easy for someone to pay for their um, property tax or pay for back rent or get a, a vaccine. Th- th- those are the things that you are trying to deliver to communities to make them successful versus, you know, I'm, I'm not against um, corporate America because I, you know, um, I, I think corporate America does some great things, but the, the difference is one's driving revenue. The other is trying to um, help folks grow and thrive in their community. So a lot of people like, well, they'll say like government has like bureaucracy, right? But big, corp- big corporates have their own bureaucracy, right? From your point of view experience, is the bureaucracy worse in public or worse in private? Well, I worked at Boeing, so Boeing was a huge bureaucracy um, because it was a, you know, an extension of mm-hmm. government, you know, providing government services. Right. But when I was at Alaska airlines, um, l- very, very much regulated, but less bureaucracy around trying to get things done and be nimble and get the work done. So, um, I compare government very much to my experience. I had the Boeing company. Okay. And let's suppose you have like a, a technician you want to do. What's the process for getting a technician approved? Uh, when it comes to government. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the big changes that for me was how councils have to be involved in the implementation of major initiatives. So if you're about to spend an amount of taxpayer dollars that's significant, you have to go in front of council and explain to them what this particular product or services. You're talking about the King County Council, right? Um, so I'm talking about the work that I was doing at, at as chief of Mason officer for the city of Tukwila. Okay. Okay. Um, when there was like a major, so even, so for instance, we want to deliver a new HR system, um, not an HR system, but actually a HR system. And we wanted to deliver a new finance system. And what that required was going in front of council and helping them understand specifically what this initiative is going to do for not only employees, um, for the city but how that's going to make the employees more effective in providing services to the community. Because there's always that extension. Like we're not going to go do um, delivery of technology for the sake of delivering technology. It's when you're in the government sector, how do I deliver this technology that's going to make it much better for employees to be more effective with the community 
or give the community a better um, product or service that they can use um, so they can be, so that they can have an easier way to do something from a community perspective. So you, you talked about this some already, but talk about the importance of, of the tech aligning with the business goals of the organization. So I, I think one of the biggest things around aligning the business goals and objectives is really learning who your customer is. And not just designing technology for the sake of designing technology. Um, a lot of times, technical folks will have made a decision about um, what type of application or system should be in place to meet this business need. When they really haven't tried to understand what the business goals and objectives are, right? H how much time have you spent with the business and under not only just understanding the business, but understanding who their customers are, and then what types of services that you can provide that business that ultimately affect allows them to give better services to their customers. And that's where I think the alignment comes from. And that's why I think so at, at King County, we're shifting into this new um, this transition of moving to product teams and safe. And what that allows us to do is to provide straight line alignment to specific things that we're trying to deliver back to the business, right? So if I know that I want to deliver products and services that uh, make employees more collaborative and more productive so they can provide better services to the community, I can show the agencies a direct line to the actual tasks and user stories and sprints that we're doing so that I can draw a line right back to say, hey, here's that business value that I'm giving you. And so that's how I think really learning the customer and really shifting to models, operational models that allow you to show value and, and, and transparently how it aligns to where the business is going. So your current position, what percent of your job is like you focus on the tech part and what part you focus on the business part? Um, right now for me, it's 50-50. Okay. Um, because as you transition to these product teams, um, you start to really think about not only the technical products that you want to deliver from an IT to IT perspective so that we're way better around delivering software and applications through platforms, but then understanding how the business will be able to consume these capabilities much faster. And so for me, it's 50-50. A lot of, one of the big things is because um, I have operational teams that are responsible for providing help desk services and production operations. And having that direct alignment to the customer where you know the problems that they're having on a daily basis, you know the number of tickets that are coming in related to applications and systems, you're very much aligned to like um, the issues that they're having out in, out in, the, in the workforce. So Joe, for your direct reports, how do you make sure you professionally develop these people and make sure they can be the best performance they can give? Like how do you professionally develop them, make sure they're doing the right thing and, and growing in their career? Well, uh, a lot of us through one-on-ones, you know, having conversations about um, leaders being strategic and, and, and not always being tactical because um, you have to have tactical leaders um, because there's the day-to-day -day operations that have to happen. But I always impose upon my leaders to, to let's have a conversation around the strategy. Where, where do you want to be in the next four or five years, right? Where do you want to be in the next 10 years? How are you going to change the face of the organization so that we're delivering value across the board um, rather than just putting out fires on a daily basis? And so that's one of the things I really push on, being strategic. The other is making sure that folks are getting to training around this transition that we're trying to um, move into. And that's really understanding the whole safe framework and understanding how scaled agile um, works in the delivery uh, of agile teams and um, software release trains and all, all, all those things related to um, how are you going to deliver value from a, a, from a business perspective. So training, one-on-ones where we actually talk about strategic thinking and then um, Working with uh, my boss, um, we are delivering a whole new leadership framework to help people change their mindset around how they want to deliver services to the customer. So those are the types of things I'm focused on with, with the teams to, to, to grow, train, and develop.
this is one of my pet peeves, right? You have like these leaders, boss, or two more leaders, and, and some work for them and they're personally, right? And they'll bash their person. This person's not loyal, you no, know, and they take it as a personal or you no know, upfront, right? My thing is this person left your company organization. They went to get a better job. Doesn't that make you look good, right? Like you train this person up to get a better opportunity, right? And if you got a good relationship, they're going to say good things about your company, right? I've never agreed. I understand why a lot of people, like they bash people will leave, right? To me, like they left for a better job, good opportunity. That makes you look good, right? Versus, you know, the case, which I don't understand that. So to me, if someone leaves your organization and they grow and thrive in another organization, that's a star or, or feather in yeah. your cap, you, right? You've done something right. You've like, done something right. This leader is a great leader in this or, other organization. It's because of what you've poured into them. And they're going to say good things about you and your organization. Exactly. And, and amazing people don't get that. Right. Um, perfect example. Um, I know a lot of, so for instance, you know, Alan Mulally, who was the, uh, C, the CEO of Boeing Commercial Airplane Group, he left Boeing and went to Ford. It ended up being like one of the top three CEOs ever, right, in the world. That puts a feather in Boeing's cap to say, look at what type of leaders we raise here where they leave and go to a company that was, that was literally failing at the time. He turned it around and made it one of the best performing companies in the world and at the same time became one of the best CEOs in the world. Top three. That's a feather in Boeing's cap. I definitely agree. Right. Definitely agree. So, so next, what's your, what's your thought on this, right? Suppose there's like the, there, there's, um, we say the power brokers in a certain area, right? And like they have, they have all the power, you know, but they know, no, we got to reach out to different people and bring them on board, right? And suppose they, they put, they do meetups every month. They try to recruit people, you know, but no, no one from that group has come to them, right? Is the responsibility of that power group, so to speak, to reach out and go to the community where they need to go to? Or is it something of, of that community to make, take, take the step and go to where the power brokers are? Try, try me again on that question. So like, suppose you're, 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 you're a tech company in Seattle, right? Yeah. And you want to recruit like, diverse people, right? So you do meetups, you know, recruiting stuff, you know, you're doing like um, meetups every month. You're putting stuff on social media. Hey, we're doing this event. We're trying to hire, you know, people of color, whatever. But none of them are coming to the meetup, right? So the, that power people then try to, okay, we, we're not, they're not coming to downtown Seattle. Let's go to South Seattle, do stuff there. Or is it some on the uh, people of color to go from South Seattle, where the case would be, to go to the power brokers are at? Good question. That's a very good question. Um, I think when you are in the space of trying to make um, communities and organizations more diverse, um, you have to be very intentional about going to where people are, right? Um, you can't like set up shop downtown and expect that people from South Seattle are going to show up, right? There might be issues around transportation. Um, folks are, might be working. And if you go where they are, there's the more of the possibility that, wow, um, number one, they see that you're trying to meet them where they are. And then two, one of the big things that drives um, a person having a relationship with you is that you kind of, you see what they're going through and you're trying to meet that need of like, I know you can't make it here, but I'll, I'll come to you. So I think it's a major responsibility of the organizations who are trying to be diverse to, to go out and find those employees and, and be very, very um, intentional about it. So Joe, how did you become involved in tech? So I came involved in tech um, really at an early age. Um, my dad uh, bought the family a Trash 80. Uh, and the Trash 80 is a Tandy 80. You remember the old radio uh, shack. The TRSR 80? Yeah, Radio, uh, shack, radio yeah. shack computers. Um, and so um, I, I just remember when I cracked open um, the manual for, after we got the Trash 80 and started looking at all the different um, like basic coding that they had in there and how you could go in and create a screensaver and all this other kind of stuff. Right. And I was just hooked. I, um, I loved like being in my room and like banging away on the keyboard and seeing how if I just typed out this code perfectly, what it would look like um, 
in, in, in creating something really cool. And so after I fell in love with that, um, my dad, um, later on, he got us a, uh, Packard bill computer. You remember Packard yeah. bill? Yeah. And, um, and that was a chance where you got to connect to prodigy and, and, and got to see like this open world of where you can connect to the internet. It was, it was, you know, mostly back then it was just bulletin boards. Yeah. Um, but then I got hooked. I was like, man, look at, look at all this amazing stuff you can do. Um, just by having access to computers and being able to create applications and just playing around. Right. And, and so from there, um, really just being involved and playing around and having friends that um, we'd be on the phone and having conversations about the next video game um, that was on a computer. Um, it, it was, um, it was amazing for me. And then um, that's what I wanted to do. I, but I was always, I was always like taking stuff apart, like VCRs and um, hooking things up for my mom and dad when it came to like, you know, um, plugging in, uh, TVs and stereos and stuff like that. It was like, it always fell on me to, to be the guy that was like putting that stuff together. And so I, I developed a love for, um, just technology at an early age. Um, and so when you, when you hire people for your current job, what characteristics did you look for these people you hire? Um, one of the biggest characteristics I look for is a continuous learner. Um, someone who may not know everything. Like a natural curiosity, so to speak. Yes. Cause it, cause you may not know everything about the job now, but it, as I'm having conversations with you, I can tell that you're curious, that you want to learn more, that you don't want to just um, do the job, but you want to innovate. Then those are the types of things I, I, I love to see. Um, and I also like to see folks that are very strategic in how they think about if I take on this role, where do I want this organization to be in the future? Right. And so that those are the types of characteristics I look for. So how do you handle this? Like, of course, you know, you want to train people up. We're having a good job, good job, but you know, of course, some people can't be trained up. Right. What's your, what's your front line where, okay, I'm trying to train this person up. He's not, they're not getting it. I need to move, I need to move on from them. How y'all do that? How do you do that? Um, I, I've always been of the mind that if the initial job that you put someone in, they weren't successful at it a lot of times it's because they're not in the right, they're not the right fit for that particular role. But there's also attributes to that person where they can be successful in another role. And I think as always, um, managers shouldn't be trying to, hey, hey, I'm done with you. Um, you're not doing the job that I want you, that I want you to be successful at. So, you know, leave the, leave the organization. We should be looking at a person's strengths and saying, oh, well, they weren't successful here, but I know they'll be successful. If we moved them into this other, uh, other area. And, and that's why I think we should really be focused in on, um, most time, most time people don't want to come to work to fail. Yeah. No one wakes up and say, I'm going I'm to fuck it up the job today. Right. Right. A lot of times it's the manager, right. A lot of managers have the wrong mindset, right. They're, they're, you can't do this and me get rid of you. Like a lot of managers are not really managers. Anymore, I think. Right. Um, if you're a good leader, that means you're a good coach. And if you're coaching up your team by, hey, I know you made this mistake. Here's what I would have done. Here's how you can get better. Here's some resources to make but you. But see, that, that takes time. And a lot of people don't want to take the time to, you know, invest in their people, unfortunately. See, and for me, I always think it, it's more of a waste of time to actually go out, put a new job break out, and try to go through I mean, this it's, whole it's process. So, it's so painful, right? It's painful. But if I can take a person that's in the organization that hasn't done a, a stellar job in a particular area, but I know that they'll do an amazing job if we just position them in the right thing for that for their skill set, I don't have to worry about putting a job break out, right? But you know, you you do want to put job breaks out there and make sure you get a particular skill yeah. that you might be looking for that might be hard to find. But ultimately, it, it's it's it, it should not be incumbent upon leaders to, if you don't feel like someone's getting the train, just throw them out in the street. Um, like I said, being a good leader is being a good coach. And you coach up people to do great work. 
And if you're not being a good coach, then maybe it's you that needs to uh, move exactly. on to another role. Exactly. How, how has COVID-19 affected um, your, your job and your department? Hmm. That's a really good question. Um, I, I think, so the funny part is I started at King County in December of, no, in November of last year. And I have not seen any of the people I work with physically. Um, and I, and I, and, and from a relationship perspective, when you're trying to connect with a new organization, that's a challenge. Cause you, that, that, that means now you have to be very intentional about, you know, setting up discussions, um, making sure when you communicate, you're really conveying um, the direction you want the organization to go um, very well. Um, because you, you're not able to have those serendipitous like discussions where you know, I can be walking down the hall. Oh, well, let me talk to Bob. Um, and not have to have, you know, a meeting set aside to go talk to Bob, right? We can just have that discussion. We don't, we don't have like those, you know, hallway conversations now, right? It's, it's all very intentional. And, and I think that's why I really want to get back to the office at least uh, two or three days a week. Because as we make transitions, um, it, it's incumbent to have relationships with people. And you can't really have relationships with people through email and video. Yeah, plus on email, a lot of things on email get this is through the wrong way, you know, yeah. the intent's not in there. But how do you deal with this, right? No, remote, remote work is great, right? However, everyone is not a good remote worker, right? Mm-hmm. How do you make sure people work remote for you can actually handle doing remote work? So I've always been of the mindset that you don't even know if people at work, if they're at, on the job are doing a great job. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so like every, every 40 hours, you're only actually working 15 hours, you're on Facebook, you're like you're doing conversations, you're like, you know, so yeah. Um. There are definitely people that get distracted and can't work remotely. Um, and the only way you can really know whether or not folks are being effective remotely is the one-on-ones and the conversation that you have and talking about um, specific milestones that you're looking for people to accomplish. And I don't care how you get there, right? Because everybody has their way of being able to do the work. Um, but that's what I look at. So if you tell, if you tell me that we want to be doing automation, um, on the way that we distribute devices in the future, for me to know if you're being successful remotely is how, how close are we getting to that end goal? And what are your specific milestones that are going to help us get there? And then as we have our one-on-ones, I can talk to you about those, those milestones. And if we're not hitting those milestones, then we have to start having that conversation around, hey, are, you, are you being very effective uh, being a, rem, uh, a remote worker? But as I said, though, right, even when, you ha- when people are in the office, you still don't know how effective they're being, right? Unless you're having these one-on-one conversations. And I'm not, when I say one-on-one, I'm not talking about micromanaging either. I'm just saying, if you tell me you're going to have four, these five or six things done in the next seven, eight weeks, then it's incumbent upon me as a leader to say, okay, do not want to once. How are you doing? Where do you need my help? Do you have all the right kinds of resources to get the job done? Yeah, that's a trick I use in the army, right? When I have someone to do something, I would say, Hey, you know, so-and-so I need you to do this for me. Here's what you need to do. When you can have it done. I have it done like in eight days. Okay. Day eight, they better have it done. Right. So I, you, you gave me your own deadline, right? You can't even meet your own deadline. Like what's, what's going on here. Right. 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 Um, so a few, a few years ago, uh, 2017, you wrote an article on LinkedIn and basically it was like the premise was people do not want you to be successful. Like 90% of people do not want you to succeed. And your, and your theory was like, in their mind, if you succeed, that means they, fit, they failed. Can you talk about that for some? Yeah. So when I was writing an article, I was really thinking about it. I think I'm, I, I'm, I did 100% agree with that. So when I was writing an article, I was really thinking about the fact that, um, when people see other folks being successful, a lot of times they look at that as what am I doing wrong? Because they are succeeding in these ways that I'm not. And I think what that, what that does for folks, it makes some folks jealous. Right. Um, and, and I think LinkedIn is like one of the greatest places where you can see jealousy. Yeah. Because um, you can, 
you'll you'll notice where if let's say you talk about some particular milestone in your career that's amazing for your um for your next step and your uh, evolution as a as a leader and the cool thing about LinkedIn is it, it lets you know how many people have engaged the content at least but then you'll but then you'll you'll see it may be four or five thousand people who engage the content but only maybe a hundred people say congratulations right and so you can look from just from that data kind of understand from that it's like well man you know i thought because when i look at the folks that i've curated in my list of folks it's not just i don't just go through and if you ask to be a, uh, a connection i just say yes i look at these connections as you know how how number one how can we help each other and then number two how does this connection grow my influence to where if I have um, a particular issue, where can I go find an expert that I've made a good connection with that I can have a conversation with and, and, and bring that person to the table um, to have a, a conversation with my organization? And so when you curate those folks, you know who they are. You, you, know, you know who your base is. You know who that base is of folks that are your followers, that kind of thing. And so when you when you see like a very small percentage of folks engaging and saying congratulations or they support you, that kind of thing, you can kind of understand that there's there's some jealousy there. And I've always I've always tried to figure out how do you how do you combat that jealousy? And I think the best way to do that is um, when you get into different roles, lay a path for somebody else to follow you, right? If I get into a role, you better be sure that the list of folks on my connection list are now they have the ability to potentially be working in the same organization I'm working in too. I think a big thing too, is like someone successful. So uh, you see someone being successful. You're like, you don't see the grind. You, 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 oh, they sold the company for $10 million. So they raised this money or whatever the case would be. They don't see all the background crap they had to go through. Right. Right. And part of this, I think on the part of the person being successful, right. Are you only posting the success stuff? So you, so you also, you know, hey, I had to work a 12 hour day yesterday and I got no, told no 15 times I lost money, right? No one posts that, right? So it's this myth out there, you know? I try to. I, I try. I talk about. And when I post and stuff on LinkedIn, I, I try to post the, the hard things that I've had to go through to get to where I am. Um, and specifically, you know, making sure that you're letting folks know that there's some hardship along the way to to, of, of your journey to becoming the particular person that you want to be or the particular leader you want to be. And so for me, um, I can remember posting specifically about some of this stuff is luck. Oh yeah. And, and, and being in the right place. At the same time. You know, I get tired of people playing this game as if there's some genius that have hacked the system and they know how to move around and, and be a leader anywhere they want to be. It's not true. A lot of times it's about who you've met, what panels you've been on, what discussions and connections you've had with people. Yeah. And if, and, and, and it is truly, if you made those folks feel good when they were having a conversation with you and, and engaged with you, a lot of times they'll probably reach out to you yeah. and tell you about an opportunity that's available that they think you might be a good fit for. I mean, you got to put yourself out there, right? You got to take chances. You got to take chances. You, you gotta, like I, I tell people in the military, in the veteran community, right? Like you have a job fair trying to find a job. And it wasn't also the veteran, you're in the wrong place, right? You got to go where yep. you're, you're the only veteran, right? You got to go different places, right? Right. Like, like a friend, for instance, um, one of my really good friends, uh, uh, Juan Padilla, is a veteran. Mm -hmm. And he's also, he used to be the, um, the HR director, or um, the chief people person for um, the Sia Tequila. And this guy knows hands down um, about what veterans bring to the table and how successful they can be in organizations. And so um, e even so, I, you know, I've had, I've had conversations with them and talked about like, you know, from a veteran's perspective, um, what do you think, what, why, why is it hard sometimes for soldiers that are coming back home to get roles? And he would go deep into like, uh, people's perception of the training and those types of things and how it's not applicable and those types of things. 
but he said that um, people really don't understand that um, a lot of these folks are very, very good at being able to make changes, right? They, they, they're logical. They know how to figure out a, a situation. They know how to take their, the training and the capabilities that they learned while they were in the military and solve real world problems. And so um, from him, um, I've learned a lot about what veterans bring to the table. But then also I learned a lot about what veterans bring to the table too, because I worked with a lot of veterans when I was at the Boeing company. Yeah. So I'll push back on this a little bit. I know a lot of military veterans, they're a certain rank, right? They're colonel, sergeant major. And the mindset is like, I had this position in the military. I set up the same position in the civilian world. Well, maybe not right. Like if, if you go for like, no, if someone, jo- if someone left Microsoft as like VP of whatever and joined the army, that can be VP to start someone like, not in the bottom of, you know, I think a lot of military people like my rank is this, I say the same equivalent, you know, and last thing, I last think a lot of military veterans miss that opportunity to start working at startups, right? A lot of startups, you could use military talent, right? But like, like me, I joined a startup when I, in my late forties, right? Everyone else is twenties, right? Most people don't have the mindset, right? They think I'm, I'm this age, I'm this level, this is what I need, right? And it's like, I won't say humbling yourself, but like putting yourself in better opportunities, if that makes any sense. It does, but, but I don't see anything wrong with that. So there's a fair amount of leadership training you have to go through to get into these roles mm-hmm. in the military. And I totally understand of why if I'm a colonel in the military and that might be considered middle to senior management, I want that same type of role when I come out. And I totally understand it because there's a fair amount of being able of training around how you lead people, yeah. right? That's very interchangeable to being in the civilian world. Well, like, I'm saying like, suppose you're, 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 you're like a lieutenant colonel, you're HR in the army. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying you have to be like an HR assistant. But maybe instead of being VP of HR Microsoft, maybe you're a HR manager for like a smaller company, right? Mm-hmm. Something mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, to me, um, like I said, I, I really see if you look at the amazing training that's going on in the military, especially around leadership and how a lot of that training um, is taken out of the military and then put in the civilian world to help teams be more successful. But then you see a person that's grown up in that training and has grown up in that environment. Then they come and you go like, well, I'm not, I'm not sure you're ready. Well then what do we, why, yeah. why do we take this training that is designed in the military and bring it to the civilian world and make teams better? If you think that this person would be able to effectively lead a team. Yeah. So, I, so um, I don't think there's anything wrong with being a veteran and saying, I'm a colonel and I should have that type of role when I come out around leading people because you've done some amazing people leadership. I agree. I agree. So, and, and you can disagree, disagree with me want to, but like my time in the army, I had a couple of jobs after army. Mm-hmm. It's like my experience has been like any organization is one of 5% like, like I do all the work, right? They're killing it. They're crushing the superstars and maybe 60, 70 percent like this doing the bare minimum and or just average, right? And then those five to 10% get burnt out, right? How do you make sure that five to ten percent you like you professionally develop them, and how do you bring up the people that do the bare minimum to become superstars? So those folks that are the, the five or ten percent that are just killing it, um, one of the big things you try to do is, is provide them new opportunities to be able to stretch their wings and 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 do more amazing work. Um, for the folks that are not. Um, you know, significantly doing the work that you want them to do. Um, I think that's where you have to have the real conversations and say, hey, look, here's the expectation and you're not meeting the expectation. And, you know, and set milestones for folks to be better at their role. Because sometimes um, there might be issues going on at home. Um, there might be issues going on with health that they won't tell you. Um, and so... I, it's, it's getting to know those, those folks, number one, and then number two, being able to convey to them the expectation that you want to have for your team and that when they fail at their role, um, it causes the entire organization to fail. Are, are there any, any tech initiatives that you're working on that you can talk about? Uh, right now? Yeah. Um, for me, I'm actually working on um, really leading and understanding culture. Um, I'm rereading the book 
um, that I got when I was at the Boeing company is a uh, culture eat strategy for lunch. And, and just really thinking about uh, from a leadership perspective, how do you convey and drive change from an operational transition model um, to make people successful? And so I'm constantly um, taking classes, um, working with mentors to really understand how you help people transition. Because that's one of the biggest parts of uh, when you do operational changes in a large organization is how do you change people's mindsets from what they're currently doing to this new way of doing work? And, and, and that's a lot of what I'm working on right now is how do I convey the message? How do I make sure people understand that we're not leaving you behind, but we're going to grow you and move you into this new role that's going to make you more successful, those types of things. Can you talk about the challenges of the tech person of keeping up to date on all the tech things changing all the time and the challenges of making sure your people keep up to date with all the tech, tech things changing? Uh, so for me, I think it's unhealthy, but I, 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 um, I mean, I'll be up to one, two o'clock in the morning, um, you know, looking at technical articles, um, looking at trends, or like new technologies that could potentially make um, some of the things that we're trying to do much better. Um, and, but that's just me. <laughs> um, what, what, I, what I do think is a lot of times folks don't take advantage of being invited to a conference or being invited to a meetup where folks are talking about some of the latest trends and some of the cool things that are going on out there. And so I try to make myself available for all those things. And, I, and, and that's why when, as a leader, when I'm talking to my leadership, I'm like, hey, get out there. So for instance, if you want to be the best, if, if we have this goal in our organization to be the best in customer service, well, go start talking to the organizations that are the best in customer service. And it doesn't have to be an IT shop. It could be Chick-fil-A or, you know, it could, it could be Costco. How, how, why do people consistently come and um, renew that Costco membership, right? Because there's an experience that they give their customers that they come back for more. Well, for one, all the cash, all the cash machines have cashiers on them. <laughs> That's one thing. <laughs> right. That's one. But, but, it, but it's those types of things, right? Um, if you, if you want to really um, understand these types of things go where people are doing it the best and learn from them. So um, you recently ran for political office, correct? Was that your yeah. first time running? So I actually ran for school board. Okay. So you said time in running. like 20, was it 2018? I think it was. Yeah. But so it was my, so when I ran for school board, school board races really aren't, they really aren't races, right? Um, you, nobody will really, you can't really have a consultant that's going to help you run for school board because they don't care. <laughs> and, um, and when it comes to uh, fundraising for a school board race, there is no, nobody wants to, to spend money on, on a school board director. Right. But um, this is really this re this recent race that I ran for the city of Tukwila. It was really my first time running and just really having a consultant really understanding data around um, who you're trying to target um, as your base. So first, thank you for running. Too many people complain about the political process. Don't go down with the boss. First, thank you for getting, trying to get involved. I appreciate it. Yeah. So why, why did you decide to run? What, 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 what make it, what's the whole process, right? First of all, how, how did you convince your wife to give you permission <laughs> to run? I know you have probably get permission from the wife. Well, I, I remember um, a great council member, Deshaun Quinn, said that if you're going to run, it's not going to just be you. It's going to be your family. And he said, the first thing you need to do before you even have, are you, before you even go out and run, you need to go have a conversation with your family to see if they're okay with being the spotlight or being that kind the spotlight of stuff. and jumping into this. So, um, so my, my wife was totally on board. My son was on board. Um, and then the next piece was really working with a good consultant that can really understand the political environment and the type of messaging we need to get out to folks. And so one of the main reasons that I ran is, you know, I don't know if people, there, there, there's those moments in life where you know 
that it's time to get more involved. And I've been involved my entire life, um, even when I was in corporate America, right? Volunteering my time and, and doing things in the community. But one of the biggest things for me that was that moment that said, Joe, you got to go run, was when we all saw George Floyd murdered on national television. And kind of realized at that moment that things have to change because a man got murdered on national television and with community members standing around asking, Hey, let, you know, let him up, let the guy live. And with, with complete malice, just, just kill the guy right there in the street because he wanted to show people that he had that power. And in that moment, I saw myself as, wow, is this what I'm going to leave to my son? Is this the type of world that I want to put my son in to where he has to worry about if someone responds to a call for him that he's the criminal and, and, and that he could potentially be, have his life snuffed out on the street? And so it was that. Plus the fact that as I was having more conversations with community members um, that they felt like they weren't being listened to is why I ran um, for Renton City Council. So you had this consultant. I'm, I'm guessing you had to pay him, pay him, right? Yeah. And so uh, do you, do, I guess you had to do fundraising to pay him or you pay for your pocket. How's that, how does that work? So when it comes to political, political campaigns, it's all about fundraising. Um, so what, what I like is the model that Seattle has where um, community members get vouchers mm -hmm. that they can take those vouchers and use them on the political candidates that they want um, for the political campaigns that they want to see those candidates um, get into different mm -hmm. roles. But you spend a lot of time um, calling friends and family who love you and want well, to support you. But they really love you enough to dig in the pocket. And you'll find out. You'll find out real quick. <laughs> uh, for me, um, there are, I have friends and family that love me, my wife, and, and, and my son. And that they, not only did they provide dollars out of their pockets, but they spent time doorbelling, having conversations with people around um, the things that we're trying to do for the community. And just because I lost, it, it doesn't mean that I, I'm going to completely like walk away and, and not push for the same platform I was pushing for because the platform I'm pushing for is timeless. It's, it's, it doesn't have anything to do with having a, a pin or on your lapel, right? It's all about <clears throat> how we can change people's lives for the better. And because I lost racism, I'm not going to push for it. I'm still going to be pushing for it. So in your campaign, you still had your full-time job, right? Yeah. So how did you balance full-time job? Basically like, basically like three full-time jobs now, right? The, your paid job, campaigning, and other things. So how did you balance that? And did you have to get permission from your job to campaign? How does that work? So I did. I, I did have to have, you know, I let my manager know that, you know, I'm running for political office um, because I was getting endorsements by labor unions. Um, that are very much um, uh, in King County. Mm -hmm. um, I, I talked to our labor representation to make sure that, hey, this isn't like a, uh, what's what I'm looking for? This isn't a conflict of interest with me running for office and also looking for the endorsements of some of these very same labor unions that are representing our employees. And so um, they were like uh, upfront, like, hey, first of all, thanks for being upfront about it. And no, this isn't, um, there's no conflict of interest, especially then they asked me, do you think asking them for an endorsement is going to change the way you negotiate with them at, from a labor perspective? And I like, no. So, okay then. <laughs> and so, um, um, I had to let them know, but then on the other side of it too, 
I was, I was burning the candle at both ends. Right. Um, I wasn't, I was going to sleep like three or four o'clock in the morning because it, it, it was just, it was part of, um, the experience of, of running for office. If you don't one, is it like a paid position and you had to quit your, your, your other job or how did that work? So if I would have won, it's, that, it's a paid position, but it's part-time. Okay. And I, and I mean, and when I say minimally paid, it's minimally paid. Um, and so, I, you know, I would have kept my current job and um, done the city council role. And if you would have won, what would be your, your time commitment as a councilman? Like 10 hours a week, 20 hours a week, or just depends? For me, because of the way that I approach things. Um, another full-time job? It was going to be another full-time job. Yeah, you got. I mean, I'm sure you just want to go to city council, be a proud of which the community did meetings and stuff, and getting input and stuff. Yeah. So there's there's people who are on that city council, um, even the mayor who got elected. They don't answer emails. Um, they don't spend time out in the community. Um, but the ones that do, you can tell, right? You can tell because the, the people love them. Um, they want they want to see want to see them they want to have conversations they want they want them to be involved in events and things like that so yeah for me um it was just going to be another full-time job so with it like i think most things like this like a part-time job how do you influence people who are qualified to run to run for office knowing that maybe they can't afford like the quit their job right how do you do that you know instead of the same people running again you know it's hard um one of the things that you'll see is when people, when you, when you want people to run for, for office, um, they're putting their name out there. They're putting their reputation out there and they're putting, the, putting themselves on their microscope. And a lot of times, if it's someone that's not from the establishment, um, there's going to be a lot of pain involved in them trying to besmirch your name. And Back in 1991, Joe Todd was late for school, you know, <laughs> and you know. Yeah, all, all those kinds of, all that, all that kind of, so for instance, because I'm black, the, the first thing out of the gate is, well, he wants to defund the police, yeah. right? Did I say that? Did, did, you, did you have a conversation with me? Um, do I believe in p- police reform? Absolutely. Do I think we need to make some significant changes so that um, police are accountable to the communities they serve. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, painting me with this um, broad brush that um, because I'm a black dude, um, I, I believe in defunding the police out of the gate is completely wrong. And then the other thing for me was um, I was actually running against a 27 year incumbent um, who didn't have much to show for the time he had spent in there. Like, what just, have you done in like, 27 what, years? It, it was funny. He, um, he actually ran for mayor and went to a interview, uh, endorsement interview for uh, Seattle Times. And the Seattle Times asked him, so what, what, what's some significant milestone? What was a significant initiative? How has your community next? improved in your, in your time? And he was like, sat there like. Well, nothing got worse. You know, but he 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 couldn't he could come with any significant um, legislation or any significant ordinances that he put in place that changed the community for the better. So I was like, I was like, for, for me, it's time to go. So um, literally, what happened though is I'm running, and he drops out. But instead, but instead of just dropping out, he endorsed somebody that looked like me, that doesn't have my values, but. To the community, it's two black guys running against each other. So obviously they think alike. So yeah. it'll just be a toss up to which one you pick, right? And it worked. Um, but um, for me, um, it, it's pretty crazy. It, it, remember, I was talking about at the top when we started having this discussion about how racism, how supremacy works, how it evolves, and how it tries to hang on to racist structures. Um, that's the perfect example where you literally um, invite someone that looks like you to be a part of the process to make sure that um, black folks, BIPOC folks stay in their place. There's a good one. 
Eddie Murphy did a movie a long time ago, right, where he ran for Congress. And the person was like, I can't remember the name of the movie. The person who had the office, he was like 89 years old, he, and he died, right? Mm -hmm. And so they had Eddie Murphy. Eddie Murphy's name was like, well, I'll make this like Abraham Johnson. The guy's name was like Abel Johnson. So they, on the file, they put A. Johnson. Everyone <laughs> thought it was the old die, guy who died, yes. right? And he got elected. Yes. Yes. And, 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 that. and for me, it's because uh, a lot of times the elector doesn't pay attention. Oh, no. Um, it, you, you have uninformed voters out there who aren't, like, really looking at the issues. And they're just going down a ballot, just circling in boxes or uh, circling if, the circle. If they even do that, right? Yeah, even if they do that, right? And so one of the things that happened in, in my particular race, we didn't have enough um progressives actually come out and, and, and cast a vote. And if you looked at the numbers, it was pretty dismal around young folks that came out to vote. So uh w one of the big things, especially with off year elections, um people gotta get out and vote. Yeah. Cause we we I don't I don't understand why we think that some significant change is going to happen at the federal level. That, that's a pit people on like every time the president says, oh vote, vote. Like example, we just, I live in DuPont, watch like an hour from here, maybe mm -hmm. 10,000 people live there, right? Like the city councilmen, they, they want like 200 votes, right? Like, are you kidding me, right? Like 200 votes? Some of you are just like kids who can't vote and stuff, but like 200 votes out of 10,000, right? That's crazy. It's like in there, and yeah, it's like. And, 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 and so folks want to vote for the president. The president just sets policy and um, tries to, you know, work with Congress to appropriate dollars that go to states. When that money goes to the state, it's your local state reps and senators and, and governor that transition money down to municipalities. Yeah. Excuse me. The transition money down to municipalities. And they're the ones that, that distribute those dollars out the community. They don't get it. Like, like in DuPont, the big thing is like, are we going to stay as a 1950s community? You know, like in like the Pleasantville, are we going to like advance to your, at least your 22,000, right? That's a big divide in DuPont right now. Everyone who got elected for the 1950s, keep things the same, right? <laughs> Right. And then people complain like, well, there's no, there's no teen center. There's nothing for kids to do. Right. And nothing about DuPont is a pet peeve of mine is like, oh, it's a kid can be like little kids. I'm just going to run our bikes, but God forbid they come teenage you come do teenage stuff. Right. Like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It's, 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 yeah. If, if people, people have got to pay attention to local politics, um, like Tipper O'Neill said, all politics is local yep. politics. Yep. And if you're not paying attention to who your council members are, who your school board members are, who your state reps are, who your state senators are, you're wasting your time. Cause you can go vote for, you can go vote for the president all you want. Um, you the, the, the change that you see that that person is trying to make at the state, at the federal level, it's still got to come through your local representatives. And through all the bureaucracy and stuff, right? And, right. And it's cause the president system doesn't mean your local government's going to go through it. Right. Right. I mean, perfect example, um, um, when the um, ACA Act, yeah, the Health Care Act mm. got passed, um, one of the first things is the states had to come up with policy to distribute the health care program, right? And you had states that said, well, we're not going to do it. Yeah. We're not going to participate. Once again, all politics is local politics. The federal government came up with this uh, health care program that's supposed to provide health care across the board for everyone. But then your state can potentially bail out of it. And now what have you done? So, yeah, you voted for this guy, but you're not going to get any, um, any, anything out of the, the policies that he's putting in place because your state decided to bail out of it. Like I said, if you want change, you want to do different things, you got to get a vote, right? A perfect example, like they're doing the, the, the federal budget or whatever. And the senator from West Virginia, I can't remember his name, right? He's a Democrat, but he's not a progressive, right? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to press, like, no, that's too much money or whatever. And finally say, you know what? If you want, if you want this, you should have voted, you should have elected more progressives. Like, damn, like, you don't want to hear that, but you need to hear that, right? Like, if you're progressive, Republican, or case B, you want your laws to be passed, you need to vote more people who agree with you, right? So for me, you're talking about Joe Manchin. No, Joe Manchin, I said Joe Manchin, yeah. Um, and what, and what, <laughs> I think the perfect example is, so, so he's this, this, He's, he calls himself a moderate. It's more of a Republican. Yeah, he's a Republican. Um, and then what I thought was the perfect example of not listening to your community. He's on a yacht and 
he had constituents that paddled out mm-hmm. in the water to the I'm, back I, of his yacht. I, I missed that. I didn't and understand. we're looking up, having a conversation with them, uh, at, looking up at him, having a conversation with him as he's looking down from his yacht. And I'm sitting here going, that's not a good optic. It's not a good actor, number one, but it's a perfect example of why you should really pay attention to who you're voting for, right? Because you literally had to paddle out to this guy's yacht <laughs> as a community member to get him to listen to you. If, if, if that isn't a perfect example of a perfect optic of why we have to have changes, there isn't, there isn't another. Yeah, just like a... Not talk about politics too much. It's like the senator from Kentucky. I can't remember his name, but he's been like 50, 60 years. He's like the minority leader, majority leader, whatever. Mm-hmm. And Kentucky always like lasted everything, right? You're like, talking about Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell, yeah. Yeah. Keep yeah. on reelecting, right? It's like just keep on reelecting him. Um, because the name you know. Like you like yeah. you're talking about with Eddie Murphy. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what he used. The yeah. whole Eddie Murphy used in that movie, the name you know. That's it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That is right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So what, what are, um, lessons did you learn from running? Um, I think one of the lessons I learned is I, I think from a, a way we spent campaign funding, I would have um, put significantly more, more, I would have paid for more people on the ground to actually go do um, canvassing, number one. Um, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have done any of the kind of digital stuff that we did, you know, take like digital advertising mm-hmm. where you go to a website and you'd see social media stuff, so to speak. Um, social media. Well, in Washington state, right. Um, you can't really use social media for, for campaigning. You can, you can post stuff on a website and say like, I'm running for office and you can talk about your endorsements and everything. But if you try to do paid campaign ads, like on Facebook mm-hmm. it's actually illegal in the state of Washington. I did not know that. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah. And so, and that, you know, that was all because of all the stuff that was going on during um, the Donald Trump mm-hmm. okay. uh, era where all this disinformation was going out. And so in Washington State, you cannot use Facebook advertisements to push your campaign. Okay. Um, but I would have spent more time, you know, getting people paid to go out and, and having conversations at the doors. Because um, canvassing is, I think, is one of the biggest things you should um, prioritize. So when someone says something we'll say not so positive about you doing the campaign, how do you deal with it? Do you like, take it right on and say, this is not the truth? Or do you just like, okay, I'm not even going to recognize this because it doesn't, you know. Uh, some of the stuff I addressed, like when they talked about, I was talking about defunding the police, right? I addressed that. Other stuff I was like, you know, if I give it, if I give it air, then it'll have a more, because, you know, just, just like the whistleblower for Facebook, one of the things she talked about was that the more negative you get, the more posts, um, the more people will interact and engage your posts. And so um, for me, I didn't want to have a negative campaign where people were engaging with a bunch of negative posts. But, um, but yeah, most of the time I just like, you know, whatever you're talking about, I'm not getting involved. How did you find your consultant? Did somebody recommend this person to you or you found them on your own? How did that somebody work? recommended them to me and, um, I, and I knew of them. Um, because they had done some great work on um, some friends campaigns. So do you plan on running again for another type of office in the future? Or I don't know. Um, right now, um, there's some other things that I'm thinking about um, getting involved in. Um, and then from perspective of running for office, sometimes I feel you can do more outside. Yeah. Um, being a politician than you can being a politician. And so it's those types of things that I'm really thinking about right now. The experience running, was it mainly positive or negative or, or a mixed bag? Mixed bag. Yeah. When I mean, you had to go like get endorsed from these different organizations, what was that, what's the process? Was it like, you know, you had to like, go beg them, like the hand and foot, hey, please endorse me. How, that, how's that process? Yeah, the endorsement process is pretty laborious. Um, you fill out a questionnaire. Um, and then they take a look at that questionnaire and then there's an interview process that you have to go through with each one of the organizations. So it, it's a significant amount of time to go out and get endorsements. But um, the good thing about the endorsements and the process is it, it, it helps you pause your message, mm-hmm. right? Because the more and more you're having that conversation and talking about the specific platform that you have with people, 
the better and better you get at, at, at conveying that message. So it's like start a fundraising, you know, you start fundraising and pitching and you're horrible. And then you just keep grinding and you grind and grind and perform. And you're like, Oh man, yeah. this, this is pretty good. And you just keep refining and refining um, uh, how you're talking about you and what you want to accomplish for uh, your community. Yeah. So Joe, is there anything else you want to talk about that we didn't cover or any question I should have asked you? No, this is, this is a great experience. I really appreciate you reaching out. So Joe, I forgot to ask you in the pre-talk, there's any like resources if you want to give, give some, give out some people like give like free 30 minute calls. I mean, you don't work for a private company, like, you know, like maybe, a, 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 maybe, maybe a connection to your mentoring program, something like that. Um, so for me, one of the main things that um, I would love for people is to engage me on LinkedIn and we can talk about ways that um, we can change um, the future of our community. Um, especially, you know, I'm on the board of Credible Messengers, and we are really trying to um, work from a as a as a board member, really trying to, you know, push into other areas and get grants to make sure that we're providing services for folks, so they don't have to get involved in violence and guns and things like that. Um, and then one of the other big things for me is, um, as I as I'm saying, I want folks to engage with me on LinkedIn is to really start having conversations around how do we really have, or how do we really embed equity and social justice into organizations so that we have diverse organizations for the future when it comes to technology. So Joe, speaking of LinkedIn, can you give us your social media so people can reach out to you? Um, so it, the, it, the funny part is my, my social media is still branded toward the campaign. <laughs> um, the campaign. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, folks can actually get to my uh, LinkedIn as Joseph, Joseph C. Todd on linkedin.com and then um for facebook instagram and also twitter is uh joe todd or Ren city council thanks and for listeners we have the link to his gift and his social media on the show notes you find the show notes at www.cabinetshrblog.com be sure to share this episode with your networks and subscribe to jason cabin's experience so joe thank you for your time can you give us any last minute wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about um, last thing for a, a wisdom perspective is number one, all politics is local politics. So, um, when it comes time to vote in off your races, make sure you're voting so that they're, you're getting progresses in office. And then two, um, if you're going to be a great leader, be a coach. Thanks Joe. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.